Good to see you, Mark Cox, my friend. It's so good to see you. Man, thank you for taking the time. Okay, so you used to be in Houston, and you just moved up to Illinois, kind of the Chicago area, little neighborhood called Downers Grove. Uh, Can you just tell us about, like, man, you've moved, you've transitioned. uh, Like, how, how is all that going? Yeah, it has been, uh, it's a roller coaster for sure. So it is full of an overwhelmingly and just in a great way to celebrate the church here that we got to step into like overwhelmingly positive, but it is fast. It is furious. Uh, I, I feel like I'm running a sprint Wow, and it's, um, which is fun and it's a lot of adrenaline and a lot of excitement, but also it's, it's, it's a lot. And it's the, I'd I'd say the shift, um, there's been so many things at the same time. So learning a different level of leadership, which we can talk about if we want to, but it's so much harder (laughs) to be the lead pastor than to be a, you know, more or less campus pastor in my former role. Um, astronomically different. Like they're not even compared. They're almost not comparable. Like the volume of decisions is, 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 at a magnitude I've never dealt with before. Yeah. Um, there's also things that are way sweeter. So I'm getting already to be part of moments that are, I didn't get to be part of because I wasn't mm. this lead pastor. So that's been really, pre- really awesome. Uh, the church here has been incredibly warm and receptive. They were really, and I could see how God's hand was on it, really primed for change. Wow. And so there's been a, a, a warm receptivity to yeah. the majority of, I mean, just for me and Dakota being here, but also yeah. for the changes we've gotten to do. So that's been really making it like a fun sprint, not like yeah. a, yeah. Uh, I don't feel like I'm running uphill, hitting resistance constantly. I feel like I'm like running downhill and uh-huh. like the people are like, we love that. Bring more, bring more. Yeah. Like they're pushing me off the ledge and I'm ready. Like, let's go. Good for you. So that's been really cool. Um, we love not being in the heat of the sun and in the gates of hell. So Bro, uh, let me tell the you. gates of hell will not prevail here because it is sunny in 75 for it's not 75 day. degrees. Oh, it's it's today it's sunny and 75. It's amazing. It's okay, so uh, amazing. This is Mark. the July episode, <laughs> but as I'm recording this, this is June 6th, which is just so we're like all on the same page here. Yeah, yep, yeah, let's get sunny and 75. It, it's it's gotta be at least 218 degrees outside here. Oh my god. Sunny gosh. and 77, but it's like 15 right. degrees of wind. And so amen. Praise God. 94. <laughs> no, 94. bro, 71 is your low. That's like, that's our high tomorrow. Our high tomorrow is 71. Yeah. You see those like Honestly, orange, you see those like I, red and orange color. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm see, a Midwestern boy. So like I, you I and I those. swapped places. I moved I'm, here from Columbus, Ohio. That's right. To Texas. And so gosh. we, and you know, it's, it's a small, subtle thing. And there's a lot of like cultural things that are bizarre and insane and it's like we're not in kansas anymore we're not in the bible belt anymore we are in in chicago and in a much more liberal area so the culture has been a little bit of an adjustment the climate oh man like it's it's amazing we are we're gonna holler at you come february Come on, we're man. Gonna do, we're going to do like a little. Yeah. Yeah. Do a switch yeah. back and be like, this place yeah. totally sucks. When it's I'm wearing- crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I hate this place and the liberals, they're crazy. So, That's so great. Um, well, dude, we miss you. Um, I, I was just say that personally, like, man, we miss you. We miss having you around, but so glad for what the Lord is, is, you know, called you to up in Downers Grove. Um, yeah. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about because this podcast is about student ministry and it's a little bit about like, how do we push students towards Jesus, but also, you know, what are we doing to push them away from faith right now? Like currently it's not good practices, bad practices that we need to fix. Um, And so you have done college. How long did you do college ministry? You know, technically eight years of college ministry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's, college is kind of that, like, they're all walking away from the church. It's always been the stat, like they're always walking away in church, like, and and there's multiple reasons for that. Um, but then there's also some bright spots. Jared, here's, here's what I'd love to do. If I can just kind of sum up my, my, my goal for our time together yeah, please. is just to prepare. So I'd love to, I'd love to hear about your experience about Mm -hmm. students who are in that phase. Yeah. But I'd also love to help parents who are in that middle school, high school phase, maybe even elementary. Um, like what are some, what are some things that you've seen in college students 
um, but before they were college students that helped them thrive in their college years. Um, yeah. So uh, can you just start us off? What is it like to minister to college students? Yeah, uh, I love I love college ministry. I still do. There's colleges around up here, so I'm like already trying to get back into um, colleges. And here's what, here's what I love about college campuses, college ministry is um, they are still, they're really just like teenagers in an adult body. So they're still <laughs> formable. There's anything is important. They're still formable. There's yeah. there's still a moldability to. They're trying to actually as they step into college, they're they're really They've been asking the questions for a long time. Now they're actually answering them. What's my worldview? What's my calling? What's my purpose? Yeah. What am I here for? Why do I exist? Um, what relationships are, what's priority to me? So that's where it comes to faith. College students, that is the time where they will, I would almost say truly and actually decide if they're going to follow Jesus as a personal volitional choice of their own. Now, the positive of that in my experience was, especially even increasingly in our culture, if they're a college student and they claim Christ, it's no joke. There's no there's no social credits anymore. There's no social media bonus points. There is zero benefit to being a gospel believing Christian. Wow. In our culture. That's, so that's interesting. the college students who are Christians are amazing to work with because yeah. they're hung because they're all in. They're it's in like, because they like, want to be in. They're in because they want to be in. And that's and that's good. And that's what we want. And that's like so. And it was, it was clarifying and it was a joy because they, they wanted to go deeper. They want, yeah. so they're craving, disciple me, teach me, give me apologetics, equip my faith. Why? Because they're all in. So they're not like, I don't have to convince them. They're convincing me. You know, half the time my college minister like, Jared, we need, we really want this. We want to go yeah. further. We want to go deeper. Yeah. That's what made it a joy. Wow. What makes it difficult that is, 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 it's the other side of the coin is, that then there's a group of people who do the opposite. Instead yeah. of going all in, they go all out. Yeah. And what we do too much is we focus way too much on that group, in my opinion. Ooh, we give way too much, we give too much volume yeah. to the group that's leaving and not enough credit to the group that's staying. That's good. That's the first thing. My second thing that I think is really important, in particular to parents and in particular to high school students, Mark, which is your passion, is that college is not causing people to leave their faith. College is exposing the faith they already had. Period. It's not, people are not deconstructing their faith when they get to college. It was already deconstructed. They just oh, didn't have gosh. language for it. They didn't have language for it. They get to college, they have language for it. They have community around it. And so then they go to, they end up deconstructing their faith. They never had it. Yeah. They never had it. It, it wasn't, wasn't an overnight decision. decision. No, it was already. No. And I get that's why I get for, as a college minister, if I can pop off for a second, I get so angry when people blame college yeah. as the reason for people leaving their faith. No, it was the heart and the home, oh, not the man. campus. Let's the heart dive in. Oh, my Let's whoo. dive in. And, okay. I, and, I, and I can give I, mean, I can, you know, I, I don't I'm not just going to leave it with bad news, but it's, no. it's the heart of the person and the home of the gospel and discipleship. That's what indicates if they're going to stay following Jesus in college um, or not. Man. So in fact, and can I, can I give you a stat that proves it? Yes. So there was a statistic Lifeway did some research of, um, of indicators, spiritual indicators of whether or not someone was going to continue following Jesus, not just in the, not just when they're a young kid going to vacation Bible school right. and stuff like that. But if they, if they kept walking with Jesus into their adulthood, so into their twenties, into their thirties, basically did they stay following with Jesus or not? The number one indicator by like a threefold margin of like standard deviation. So it, that's like massive in statistical terms. The number one indicator of someone continuing to walk with Jesus is personal Bible engagement. Yeah. Period. It was like three times higher of a differentiator versus if they went to youth group or church or Christian school or what or VBS or one. The, the number one is like, did they personally choose to read God's word? Why is that an indicator? Because when they get to college, are they going to continue to personally right. choose to read God's word? Or are they going to personally choose to do what they've been doing for over a decade, which is not read God's word? So when mm. they get to college, it just exposes they were never in the word. Mm. They weren't walking with Jesus. They went to church. They weren't going to Jesus. So it's the heart engagement in the word, and it's the home 
centering around the word of God, like mm -hmm. Deuteronomy chapter six gives us this saturated life of the gospel mm -hmm. as part of the home life of discipleship. That mm -hmm. is what you're going to see. You're going to see if that's happening in college or not. Yeah. Wow. Um, so can you maybe shine a light on maybe some things that you've seen? Okay. So we're talking to middle school and high school parents, like I said, maybe even younger than that. Um, uh, what what are some maybe what are some stories of of, of examples mm. maybe that you've seen that families that are doing that well, yeah. um you know and and it could be even someone that's like a personal testimony like a like a like someone I've watched their journey and it was because of their rootedness kind of what was that family what is a family like that that does that mm -hmm. well in those early years before college even starts. Yeah. Oh man, that's like a fantastic question. I, 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 my college ministry experience only gave me the side of like, it wasn't usually happening in the home. Yeah. And so I kind of became not, not became their primary disciple maker, but I was like, Hey, you're here now. Like you got to choose. Do you want to yeah. spend time with us or not? Yeah. I can, I yeah. can meet with you once a week. You got to choose the other ones. Yeah. Um, you know, but the families that I, I like observationally, the ones I've mm -hmm. seen do really well, um, and I don't know if this is going to Houston's first people or not, and I, but I'm just going to give the shout out to Pastor Greg. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know Grace and Mott really well. Um, pastor Greg, uh, senior pastor of a gigantic mega church and uh, his son, as strong as it gets in, in faith, not putting him on any kind of pedestal, but just a tremendous man of God. And I got to spend some time with Grayson. And what was evident to me was it was it was it was both and Grayson personally was wanting to walk with Jesus, spend time with God. And so there was a personal desire that Grayson had, and he was following yeah. up on that. Yeah. And yet there was also an environment of the home that encouraged him. Hey, it's not just my dad's a pastor, which that would be the easiest of all the examples. Like, yes. oh, my dad's a pastor. I have to be at church. I have to do all these things. Have to, have to, have to. Mm -hmm. There was an environment in the home where it was a want to. And my hunch is, is in, in as much as we want to all find the formula, here's what I believe without a doubt is the reason that our pastor and his son is the, the type of discipleship relationship we want to see. Yeah. It's, it's because pastor Greg personally wow. spends time with Jesus every day, yeah. lives it out in the home. And so then it's a want to, not a have to from the child. Wow. And I think that atmosphere is what's created. I don't think it's this like magical potion of like yeah. devotion explosion in the home. Right. And just like, you know, like if we just did this, 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 and like sprinkle it together, voila, they're a believer. No yeah. parents like, you like, do your kids ever catch you reading the Bible? Mm. Have they ever caught you praying on your knees? Yeah. Have they ever seen you walk out your faith outside? I'm not talking like, let's exclude Sundays, Wednesdays, church events. Do they ever see you do something spiritually with God outside of programmed events from the church? If they don't, then why would they? Because yeah. they've not seen it in the home. Yeah practice by you. Now, I, I mean, I think there's a place for family devotionals. I think there's a place for all that, but there is zero replacement for them just seeing it modeled out day in, day yeah, out, 365. Yeah. And I know our senior pastor, Greg Mott, and I know he walks with Jesus yeah. personally and humbly. And that's what I believe is the reason his own son yeah. chooses to follow Jesus and walks in that. Well, uh, that's so good to shine a light on that too, because uh, we have so many stories of yeah the pastors who have shown us mm -hmm. that they're leading a double life. And obviously yeah. there's this testimony of like, you can't fake it. Like you can't, you can't microwave a grace and Mott, you know, and just yeah. be like, ting, like he's ready and he's per, you know, like, and he's not perfect, but, but yeah, I've, yeah. I've had a, a tiny bit of time to walk with Grayson and, and yeah. I would fully agree with you. Yeah. And I don't want to put either of them on the pedestal. Pastor Greg's not perfect. Right. Oh my gosh. Start just as far as an authentic, true on stage off stage person so in the same way parents i know you're, you don't you may not think well i'm not pastor greg no but who you are at church and out of church is what your kids see yeah. who you are at bible study not at bible study so you see and in some ways this also i think takes off the pressure that parents feel because it's not this like go find the magic ticket it's this authentically walk with jesus yeah. personally do it for your own walk with Jesus. Let it be selfish, actually, because you need God yourself. Yeah. Like, spoiler alert, you need Jesus. Just you might as, as, as well you. do it in front of them. Yeah. So do it for yourself and then let God benefit the rest of that to your family. Yeah, that's so good. I think it I think there's, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of people that I talk to pretty often in my head. And there's the reaction of the, oh, my gosh, it's up to me. 
Um, mm-hmm. Am I going to ruin my kid? There's a lot of pressure around that. Yeah. But then on That's- the other side, I, I love, I love the, the, the kind of the pressure off moment of just saying like, well, first of all, there's a cumulative effect, you know, it's, you're probably not going to ruin them in one day. You're probably not going to build them up to, you yep. know, to in one day, exactly. Um, exactly. you know, and so, so there's just a, just a, a day by day, you know, yeah. kind of like you're saying, w- walking it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we and, over, we over rely on those big spiritual yes. moments and we hyper, we way over minimize the impact yeah. of the day to day. That yeah. one conversation that you can have in your kitchen or around your mm-hmm. you know, living room or, you know, around dinner. Um, you know, I, the way I see it is um, I think that maybe in the church that we've, we've, we've maybe overemphasized like mission trips and, and it's hard. It's difficult. Cause when you're on a mission trip, you're like all like, intentional and focused and when can i share and then somehow we get in we pull our car into the garage the garage door comes down and then it's all of a sudden like not a mission trip anymore um Mm -hmm. and the gospel sharing or 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 the witnessing if you will right literally the the testimony that you're giving is your is your life and so your life is telling that story uh, yes. that's just so good. I, I think that take, yeah. I, I think it does take the, hopefully take the pressure off for parents I think it does. just, just yeah. day by day, walk it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just yeah, walk with God. And then, and then that what scripture says, like the more you read scripture, it's like, Oh, it is, is a bunch of people just doing their best with walk with God and then let God and in Proverbs. It says like train up a child in the way he should go. He won't depart from it. doesn't mean you're going to have perfect children. doesn't mean it all goes easy and it's not a whole, it's a mess, but just, Walk in the right direction, point yeah. your kids in the right direction and let God do that work. What would you say uh, are some things? Okay. So surely you have had some students who are struggling with their faith and, mm-hmm. uh, and whether it's just because deconstruction is kind of a buzzword or, or yep. whatever, um, what are you experiencing around those students that are kind of struggling? Is it, is it they, they, um, are struggling with what they believe? Are they losing trust in the local church? Um, is it because their friends have kind of walked away? It's made them walk. What are some of your maybe just anecdotal, you know, experiences and yeah. talking to them about, about those kinds of things? Yeah. You know, it really is a mixed bag. Like it comes from some different sources. I think there's a couple of like, uh, key things that for parents can be thinking about is, is a lot of it does start when culture is asking a question that the church has been ignoring. That's kind of like where I would say like the centrifuge of like where deconstruction is starting. It's because culture is asking the question and even having the conversation, whether it's right or wrong, there's still, it's out there. It's being asked by culture and the church is ignoring it mm-hmm. or silent about it or putting our heads in the sand because we, that always goes really well historically. Like, what are we doing? And so what what's happened is culture is asking questions that the church isn't answering. And so then these young people they can't go to the church. So then they either have to go to culture or they got or they choose to figure it out on their own, which the ones who do end up having really strong faith and they're constructing their faith, not deconstructing. Right. But but because of the loudness and the noise of what the questions culture is asking, they're they're going to culture to get the answers that the church should be answering. Hmm. So we've got to set the table at the church and in the home to answer the questions that culture is asking we can't ignore it and we can't just say oh well that's culture and not us like no that culture is in your life you live in a culture we can't like so i'm not trying to create culture war here i know sometimes that happens i'm saying like we live in the culture it's the air i breathe you breathe we're in culture and so it's all around us what we want is in the home and in the church to be speaking into the culture communicating, answering the questions and actually being able to get answers to questions that culture can't give. But we're so scared to give the wrong answers or we're scared to let people ask those questions in the church that we choose to just ignore it. And so I think that's a huge part. And then let me give you a different take that Mm -hmm. I also think is happening. That's like the, I think actually the positive of that. So culture is asking good questions. The church, let's step up, bright day for us to welcome questions, answer questions, point people to the Lord. I also think that what's happening with deconstructionism is, um, and I'm not sure what the right, like if this phraseology will work, but there is a group of people that are provoking questions 
that actually no one's asking, but that's leading to deconstructionism because it's these very, uh, almost like, intr like an intruding thought. And, and, and I think sometimes there's a group of people that are provoking questions that no one's asking, no one knows the answers to, and they're just like throwing them in like a grenade. It's like, and boom, let's drop yeah. this one in. And we're entertaining those ones, but not addressing the real ones. And so I think being uh, really mindful and tactful. Of, Do you have uh, any examples of, of those that like the kind of the scratching the yeah. non itches? Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm like, um, I'm thinking about it cause I'm preparing a, a, we're doing a sermon series this summer on Joshua. Um, and so like, this is, this is a book I'm, I'm reading called is God a moral monster. Yeah. So this is a grenade question. Yes. This is provoking a question that now maybe you could say a few people are asking it. Um, but most aren't, most yeah. aren't thinking about that. And, and yet they're there. These are these like grossly exaggerated questions that are being inserted and then just pew, let them explode. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, that I, I think that's what I'm thinking about with a book like Joshua that just like people yeah. are like, God's a racist. He's a moral monster. He's, you know, yeah. xenophobic. He's all yeah. these things. It's like, who's asking those questions and who's reading? Yeah. You've never read the entire Bible. You just know that's not the heart of God. Right. And so um, in some ways it means like identify dumb questions and like, yeah, just nip them in the butt. But also, them, yeah. I'm not sure about, yeah, yeah, expose that. The other part is like, um, yeah, I think on the, on the equipping of the church to, to to actually say, hey, you know, when you go off to high school and college, there's going to be people who've heard a sound bite about the God who takes out the Canaanites and he's a terrible, wicked God. Yeah. Let me just, you know this, but God so loved the world. Yeah. And you know this, but like God actually rescued a Canaanite. Her name was Rahab. She was a present prostitute sinner. Canaanite of the other nations, not Israelite, that she was saved and rescued because God's yeah. a God of grace and compassion, not just wrath and randomly taking people out. Right. And so to like not get into the trap of like those provoking questions, but instead, yeah, point them to the right places. So um, and surely and surely being being there, we, we've talked a ton about uh, giving space for students to ask their hard questions. Um, yeah. and that that's come up in multiple interviews. Um, but I think the, the key to kind of like what you're saying is, um, if I can put the whole thing together for people and, 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 and truly like there's a, there's a church version of this and there's a family version of this. There's a, there's a around the dinner table. Um, but then there's like the in church circles. Uh, so, uh, youth pastors listening might, might key into the fact that you need to kind of slot in some program time, um, mm -hmm. to address some of these things. You, you even called out the, the fear. I think that maybe, maybe the major motivator, um, the fear that I am afraid to address these things. Um, or there's the idea of like the, I, if I address these things, I, I could kind of step into something that I don't want to step into, uh, or they're like, it's a muddy conversation or it leads places where I don't know how to handle, uh, kind of the, the responses or, and I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, it's, to kind of, to kind of joke about it, there's, I, I've always, we, we, we pastors joke like, Oh, don't do open mic night. Don't do open mic night. And I, and I get it, yeah. but I, but I also, I'm like, like at some point, don't we need to like at some point, and I, and you know, I'm not saying like every church service any person can come up here and say whatever kind of foolishness you want to say, but yeah. you know, obviously there are students kind of in our, in our groups that, that need that space to ask because what, what I have been hearing. And again, this is going to sound like a broken record for anyone listening to this for the, you know, from the beginning. Um, so many students from, from, you know, the last 20 years have said, I didn't feel like I could ask those questions because right. I felt like it was disrespectful. A lot of parents have said, don't ask those questions. Don't challenge those leaders. Cause that's disrespectful. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're doing a disservice. Like they've got to be yeah. able to ask somebody. Yeah. And on the other side, I've actually seen parents, even at our present church that um, they don't want their kids introduced to the other ideas oh. to, which I, to, which, to which I'm like, Great. So shelter them until they get exposed 
Yeah. At a time when you're not there for them. So in this case, I don't know if this is touchy, but I, I, I'll just give my, so it's like, you know, we teach a, a seven day literal creation at our church and we have a church with a school, which I believe in too. I'm a geologist, by the way, fun fact. And I still believe in a seven day literal creation. Yeah. However, there are other theories that other even Christians hold. Mm -hmm. And there's just obviously other, like the, the, the general science classes in any high school or college is going to teach a 4.3 billion year old earth, give or take. Yeah, yeah. And so if you just like, if you say, well, we don't even want them to know about the other views. Well, then here's what happens. You only teach them one view and you say, this right. is the way, the truth and the life. No right. one comes to the father unless it's an early, you know, young earth with a seven day creation. Mm -hmm. And so you do that. Then they get exposed to teachers saying pretty dogmatically, this is a 4 right. billion year old. And then they're like, well, what do you mean? My mom and dad in my school, everyone told me that it was only seven days. It's only yeah. seven days. So the option, there's only a seven day literal creation, 24 hour day kind of thing. And then they're, they're, they're kind of blindsided. They're also actually, this is, this is a unique take on it, Mark. This is my opinion. They're embarrassed because in front of their whole class, they might be the only one or two who hasn't been exposed to the alternative options. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think parents are scared to give the options but I think the risk of not giving the options is a greater detriment to your, to your child's faith. Yeah. It's like, here's, here's the variety of things you'll hear about creation. But here's why we believe this one. Because mm -hmm. we read Genesis day one, day two. Mm -hmm. It was night, it was day, the first day. And then you're actually helping them understand it, not just telling them, hey, you better believe it. Seven days, literal, believe it or not, you know. Or if you're like me, you grew up in a church, if I can just get personal for a second, you grew up in, in church systems that, and this is no, sh you know, no shade, I mean, you know, be respectful and all that. But like there, I really, f the, the, the vibe that I felt from the pastors that, that taught me, and I'm thankful for their faithfulness. I don't think anyone had kind of moral failures, but there was kind of a dogmatic, like there's only one interpretation. In fact, mm -hmm. the word interpretation probably wasn't even used. It yeah. was like, this is what the scripture teaches. And, and so um, things like uh, uh, the tribulation, the, you know, the, the whole kind of like end times thing, there was, yeah. there was never like, there's multiple ways of looking at this or um, yeah, seven days of creation. Um, and, and so for me, I started hearing some alternative interpretations that are good and conservative Right. And I began to think if, if that, if, if I, if I could have been wrong there, what else am I wrong about? Correct. Or if there's, exactly. What, yep. what else, you know, and I lose a little bit of trust, unfortunately, because yes. it's like, if yes. they weren't willing to give me yeah. the alternative views of this, am I wrong in some other areas? And so that's where I would say the positive end of, of deconstruction, yeah. which I'm a big fan fan of to be honest um yeah. is because there's de there's right there's, there's multiple definitions i'm there a big is. fan of like hey let's just take this thing down to the studs and see what it's made of and build yeah. and build it stronger like like let's let's agree on those kind of closed-handed issues that are our foundation um right. and, and so i have changed some of my beliefs over the years and i think it's for the better um yeah. you know and, and so and i think yeah. for parents to be okay with like teaching parents, Mark, you and I think about it a lot. You know, there's, there's things that are primary that pertain to salvation. There's right. things that are secondary that pertain to maybe a general unity. And there's things that tertiary, which like, I don't give a care. I really right. don't. I don't care. I don't care if you want to do this or that. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And what we've, what we've done holistically in the American church is we've made everything primary and everything is divisive and everything is an all in. Look, it doesn't matter what your belief is on the end times or creation. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's yeah. primary. Right. Is he a triune God or one guy or just mono? Like, is it is it three and one or one and one? Like, what? That's essential. We got to protect that at all. That's that's what we want to put your focus on. Yes. When you start getting to secondary, third issues, putting them primary, it's also confusing our kids that then it's it's all primary. So if creation's primary because you talk about it more than Jesus, mm -hmm. and then creation gets kind of blown up because there's other views, then well, there's other views on Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's why they go together. Yes. And that's why we got insulated environment isn't helpful. Um, and just to separate, even wow. for parents, prioritize what matters most. Do you really, does it, is, is it winning? Are you winning the war by convincing them of your secondary third? Of your one. Third year? Yeah. That I'm not saying so open up the fruit basket of like total chaos and everyone's, it's not like book of judges. Everyone does what is right in their own eyes, right. but there's things that are of first importance. And then there's things that are secondary. Absolutely. So, 
even parents, that might be helpful language for you is say, hey, you know, we'd love to talk about creation. And we just want you to know, this isn't pertaining to your salvation. Salvation is in Christ alone, whether you believe in old earth, new earth, seven days, not seven days. But we do think it's important because we love the Bible. We honor the Bible. So here's why we land here. But it's not primary. And it's actually even okay if you just, you know, want to wrestle with that. It's okay. Yeah. It's not going to affect them. They're not going to hell because they yeah. believe in the different nature of the earth. My God. But we've done that with like eschatology. We've done that with creation, like age of the earth. And we've done that with uh, recently with political things. Like what yeah. are we doing? Yeah. We're confusing right. the generation of what's important. And we got to get back to that. Uh, and and I would just say, just as a as a commercial, like we desire to do that. I mean, not a perfect church, not a perfect student ministry, not a perfect student minister. Like we get it wrong sometimes, but uh, I can tell you that at Houston's First, um, in, in our in our you know youth ministry, um, we desire to at least explore those things in a safe place. Um, we have a pretty conservative view of Scripture. It's I don't know that it's all that difficult to find out what we believe. There's there's elements on our website. I'm an open book. I'll tell you what I. I believe in some things, not purposely trying to confuse kids, but like giving them space. It's a value for us. And so um, I, I love, I love when parents give us the opportunity. And, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm not uh, the only one, like hopefully mom, dad, you're doing at home That's as right. well in addition. And so that partnership is able to, to kind of help, help all these students kind of get, get, get a good solid grounding and foundation um, in their faith. Um, yeah. So thank you. That's all that is so helpful. Uh, Jared, T tell us this. Um, let me shift focus to someone who is like maybe they have a kid in college, or maybe you know, I don't think there's a lot of college students listening to this. But um, what is, what are some of your best practices for con connecting to? There's obviously the relationship with Jesus, but also in the local church. Like how how would you encourage someone maybe who's graduating this fall, mm -hmm. and moving off to a different city, and they've yeah. got to you know connect in a church. So I'm talking to the college student. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and, or by way of the parent, the parents can be like, Hey, you know, yeah. Jarrett says this. Okay. Can I be, can I, I'm going to give like, this is going to be dramatic. I'm going to, I want a hundred percent of what you have to offer. I mean, you know, I'm dramatic. I'm a little, I'm a little extra. Just a little bit. Uh, you got, I, I honestly believe in for, if they've been in the church and they're going off to college uh, I, and statistics to prove it, you got one shot to stay in church and it's your first Sunday. Statistics show that if you don't go to church on your very first Sunday opportunity, that you do not regularly go to church for the rest of your college life. Whoa. Period. So I don't know that I've heard that. I'm talking first, I'm talking first, 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 not second. Move in, freshman orientation, first. Sunday's so coming. You go to a church. Wow. Because the moment you don't, now this is in the assumption that they were already also in the pattern of going to church. Yeah. Because the moment they don't, that next first week of school, are you kidding me? It's crazy on campuses. Yeah. And all the things you pull away. And once you miss one week, it's easy to miss two. It's wow. easy to miss three. It's easy to miss four. Yeah. One, the first one. So it's okay. all, I, 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 would, I would put disproportionate, like insane amounts of effort towards the first Sunday of the school semester. So in the same, so in the same way that, I mean, like you've got to buy everything for your dorm room and you got to, man, or do we, do you know your course load? Do you know, like you literally have to prepare because you're not necessarily, you know, like, you you got to make that decision a month ahead. You got to start shopping in the summer. Yes. Like looking at the yes. different churches, yes. what's nearby. Yes. 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 Yeah. Get ahead of it. Yes. Yeah. So I'm putting the emphasis on the day you arrive on college soil and you go that, that first Sunday, but don't wait till that Sunday. That's the whole principle. Yeah. Like what you said, Mark is gold. Look it up, go search for it. Um, there's all, every church's website. So that's great. Oh, you man. can find churches. And even if that's not the one they stay at for the whole college time, right. it's, it's the principle. Seek first the kingdom yeah. of heaven and all these things we added that to you. Keep that, uh, and the, keep that Sunday person. morning rhythm. So even like you're saying, if I can just repeat that, um, even if you don't keep going to that church, I mean, you might just try four different churches, but like that yeah. Sunday morning at nine o'clock, you're going somewhere or whatever the time is. Yep. Because it just puts in that pattern that I'm going to go to church. That's so good. In, on my own in, in college. And so right. how do we set the table for that? Parents, youth pastors, you, you just, you put a lot of focus on it yes. and you, and you, and like, you don't just check on them two weeks into the semester. You're two weeks too late. Mm -hmm. You check in that Saturday night. Hey, you got a church. Are you going Sunday morning? Did you go? How did you know? And you just, you put accountability, you put weight there. Um, the best, 
youth pastor I've ever seen do this. I'm sure others do too, but uh, Spencer Jones, shout out to him. He was at, he's his first, he's in Alabama now. Mm -hmm. He did that with his high school senior group. He actually brought them to our downtown college ministry campus at the time, brought them to, to us to go to, he like would, this was in January. So like right before six months before they're going to be graduating, go off to college. He took them to our church college ministry. He took them to college station college ministry uh, on a Sunday morning. Instead of going to Sunday school, he was taking them to other churches saying, hey, here's what you go and look for. Do they open God's word? Do they center around Jesus? Is it gospel centered? Yeah. Do they have places for you to get plugged in? And, and that that class of seniors, I, I, I don't know the numbers he would have to take. I, I would anecdotally say it's at least 90 percent or above remained in church either with us or someone else because he started taking them to churches six months in advance. Oh my gosh. Jarrett, I am going to change my uh, plan in this <laughs> with seniors immediately. Yeah. Uh, Spencer is our December interview, by the way. So, uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. You should ask him if he can give you the, I might be, I mean, I'm an exaggerator again, just a little extra, but it was, it was remarkable. I, I saw the students that came to our ministry because oh, of it. Okay. Okay. Uh, man, can, can I just, um, if you were to give us one final part, we got like a minute left here. Um, yeah. If you could look at uh, the parent of every middle school and high school student. Yeah. You've got 30 seconds. What are you, what are you sharing with them? Oh man, that's, it's, it's walk with God. Like that's all, that's all I can say. Like to the yeah. parents, like, yeah. oh my goodness, have an authentic personal relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Live a grace-filled life. And your kids are going to see it. They're going to hear it. They're going to watch it. And then they're going to want to follow in it. That's amazing. Jarrett, thank you so much. You have lit me on fire. Okay. And That's I'm, awesome. I'm going to charge, go <laughs> I'm going to charge out with a squirt gun right now, but thank you so yeah. much, dude. We, like I said, we miss you, but like, you're doing such great work out there and uh, I'm Thanks. thankful for you as a friend, but also just as a, uh, someone who's encouraging me left and right. And so thank you for spending some time with us and encouraging parents today. Well, it was a joy. I love you. I appreciate you. You're knocking it out of the park and just grateful to be on this and just speak into it. Thank you so yeah. much.